Aloha, welcome to our weekly show on Condo Insider. We talk about association living and I've invited my good friend back, Jane Sugimura, to talk about an important call to action. We need your help and your help we need is good for you because it will potentially save your association a lot of grief, a lot of money and a lot of anguish. And we're gonna be talking about that on the show. But part of this is maybe a little bit of a legislative update and recap. Uh, when you, there's a lot of bills, thousands of them introduced every year. When you get down to the association issues, forgetting ones that may touch on associations, there were really six bills passed this year that by the legislature that affect association living. Very briefly, we have three bills that have been signed into law, and we have three bills that are pending a decision by the governor, and they could either be vetoed, signed into law, or become law because he takes no action on them. And so just by his lack of veto, and his lack of signature, they become law. And, the, and kind of the due dates on that is June 24th, he's required to list those bills that he may, not, he may veto. So of those three bills, if they're not on the potential veto list, they will become law either by signature or uh, by him just allowing the time to elapse. There are three bills that could potentially be on the veto list. And one of them is critical to every association in the state of Hawaii. But before I discuss this with Jane, uh, I'm going to call the elephant in the room bill. Um, <laughs> the other two bills, one of them is fairly benign in my opinion. It's Senate Bill 552, which basically extends 514A for 12 more months for developers, not for your association, for developers. Because there's maybe a half a dozen associations out there that the public report was under 514A and, and, uh, and 514B is now the standard of the industry. And developers in some cases didn't do what they should do by amending their public report. So this basically gives these developers with unsold units and condos that are under 514A another year to get their paperwork in order so 514B applies. Pretty benign. I don't see any particular issues with the governor uh, from my perspective. The second one was House Bill 61, which we've talked about priority of payment, where uh, the prior year, basically the legislature passed a law disrupting an association's ability to have priority of payment. And what House Bill 61 does is restores the ability of a board to have priority of payment after certain checkboxes have been marked, and that means that, first of all, you have to apply all payments initially to common expenses. So it kind of allows and restores priority of payments, but in a limited fashion in the sense that any payment first has to go to common expenses. And this is important because we live in an electronic age, and there's so many different types of assessments by associations from uh, buying a HO6 policy, an insurance deductible, the storage fees, boat lockers, you name it. In this electronic age, when you pay your visa bill, you don't say pay first to Macy's, second to Bloomingdale's, third to Saks. It's all kind of an electronic function. So associations for efficiency needed to have the ability to have priority of payments after the payments are first applied to common expenses. And that's House Bill 61. And there wasn't a lot of negative testimony on that. So we're hopeful that that won't make the veto list either or move forward, uh, become law. But now back to the elephant in the room, which we've talked about in several shows, Senate Bill 551. And I took a lot of time introducing this and welcome, Jane. Welcome, thank you. So thank you. I, do we have any time left to discuss it? Oh, after, yeah. after my long introduction? No, no, anyway. no, I think that was very helpful to, yeah, to the audience. Yeah, this, just briefly again, remind everybody what Senate Bill, where it came from, why it's important, before we talk about our call to action. Okay, Senate Bill 551 uh, is uh, basically to address a, a, a court decision that was made by the Hawaii Inter uh, Intermediate uh, Court of Appeals. And that court last summer 
found uh, in a foreclosure action that uh, associations can only do non-judicial foreclosure if there was a specific authority in their governing documents, which is their declaration or their bylaws, or you know, or there was a, a, a written agreement between the unit owner whose unit's being foreclosed and the association. And that just didn't exist. And the reason for 551 is because of this, and, and that court opinion basically claimed to have looked at the legislative history and said, we don't see anything in the legislative history that would support uh, associations using non-judicial foreclosure. And that's probably because who, whoever was arguing the case before the, uh, the appellate court didn't point out to the, the court, you know, because there is documentation. There are committee reports. There is uh, testimony that shows that the legislature clearly intended. In fact, they changed the law. And they basically put into the law that, you know, uh, that associations could do non-judicial foreclosure. And this was back in 1999. Okay, and, and so they, they were told, and so the law was changed to specifically allow them to do the non judicial foreclosure because at that time, because of the recession and all these court delays, it was almost impossible for an association to complete a judicial foreclosure within a year. Well, think about it. There's a lot of associations that were formed in the 70s and 80s before the law was amended or made uh, into law non judicial foreclosures in 1999. Certainly, their governing documents would never have any provision in there with respect to power of sale, because no one really knew about it until 1999. And I would just point out to you, we know we had the big recession in 2008, that I had a project on Maui that's 64 units. It was primarily absentee owners, mainland owners, nothing against them. That 30 units walked away from their units in, 19, in 2008, meaning that associations had almost half of their cash flow gone because people walked away and said foreclose. If you had to do a judicial foreclosure, it could take years. Right. Where non-judicial gave the association the ability to get possession around the first mortgage and the other obligations, rent the unit out and help recover themselves right. so that financially. They, so that they could have cash flow to operate the building. And, and, and back in 1999, we had a similar situation with recession, and we couldn't, you know, get the foreclosures through the courts. So the legislature uh, changed 514A, and they put language in the statute that said that the associations could do uh, the, the non-judicial foreclosures just like, you know, the, the banks could. And it referred to 667, a section that, is, that was later on repealed, but they, they referred to that section that referred to that 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 dealt with non-judicial foreclosure, and that section of the, the the law also said that when by by us making this new law, then every association's uh, declaration is deemed to incorporate by reference this statutory right. In other words, you don't have it in your. It, it, it acknowledged that none of the associations at that time in 1999 had that language. But the statute said that, that all these governing documents, it will, this language will be deemed to be in, in, in those documents. And so it was clear that the legislature intended uh, for associations to have this remedy so that they could go out and enforce their uh, payment of maintenance fees so that they could operate their buildings. And correct me if I'm wrong, if you look at the kind of the foreclosure history in Hawaii, it began in 1999 with what I'm going to call part one of 667. Yes. And then in 2012, that was repealed, and Part 6 became the law. Right. But the problem is when the ICA, Internet Media Court of Appeals, ruled on the Sakal versus the Hawaiian Monarch, they actually ruled on Part 6, the newer law, and said that it, there wasn't evidence of the legislative history, which, you know, I'm not that bright, but I can read, and it seems to me it's pretty clear in the legislative reports and the law itself that the legislature intended for associations to have this right of power of sale uh, in, in the law. Right. And Senate Bill 551, after the Sakal decision in 2018, basically says, we really mean it. We, it's a message to the, the judiciary that, hey, you know, you guys 
you know, didn't read far enough. We really did intend to give associations the right to do non-judicial foreclosure. And it is part of the legislature, uh, legislative history. It is there. Uh, why they didn't look at it before they made their decision, uh, we don't know. But the, 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 this Bill 551 is basically to correct what happened in the Sakal decision, uh, you know, so that, you know, because it's, it's really unfair when you have all these associations who were trying to enforce their uh, maintenance fee covenants, you know, use non-judicial foreclosure, and they thought it was legal. It's in the statute, and so they think it's legal, and they use it, and now they're told 20 years later, hey, you screwed up, and it's illegal. And so, so that's why 551 is so uh, important that we get it uh, uh, passed. Well, I was at a seminar today where a couple of lawyers were talking about this particular issue, among others. And basically what's happened is, because of the Sakal decision, now you have a whole bunch of lawyers all over town running around finding people who lost their units because of non-judicial foreclosure and filing lawsuits all over the place, creating damages, which whether you live there or not, the time the foreclosure took place, the current owners are going to be liable, saying that this owner who never paid his bills and got foreclosed on was harmed, and so all the paying owners now should give them some kind of award for damages. Right, and the, 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 the really unfair thing is that you're talking about non-judicial foreclosures that occurred between 2008 and 2011. Doesn't, it doesn't affect non-judicial foreclosures that occurred after 2012. And the lawyers today at the seminar were saying because of the Sakal Division referred to Part 6, there is some risk for those that, include, that occurred after 2011. Right. Because, there is some risk. There is. It's a, but, it's but a they, different that's level a, of risk. That's the Sakal decision, I think, has confused people. It's, it's, for, for one thing, the foreclosure law is very... You know, confusing and convoluted, especially with all of the recent federal decisions that have occurred because of the things that mainland banks have done, and you, you've heard, you've heard all the bad things, the robo signing, and not being able to have the promissory note when you file a foreclosure, and you know things that our local banks like Bank of Hawaii and First Hawaiian Bank and Central, they you know they just don't want any part of it. But they, you know, and, and I was on the mortgage foreclosure task force when we were trying to deal with, you know, what was happening on the mainland. And the local banks tried to get a carve out. But, you know, that's unconstitutional because a bank is a bank and you can't treat a local bank differently from a mainland bank. Right. And the mainland banks were doing all these awful things that all of us read about in the newspaper. And so that's why some of the, you know, the legislature, we, we, we made recommendations to the legislature on tightening up, you know, the foreclosure statutes. But the foreclosure laws that's written today, ignoring this non-judicial judicial, provides that owners have a right to go to the board and request a payment plan if they got delinquent. Yeah. So in these foreclosures, you have situations where either the owner didn't do anything about it and go to the board to look for a payment plan. Or in one case, I was reading one of the testimony for people against SB 551, and, and they were talking about how they tried to get the board to give it a payment plan. And I was talking to the management company, and yeah, they had a payment plan, but it would take 46 years for them to catch up based on the payment plan, which the board deemed unreasonable. So it's almost like they're looking for... I understand, and, and, and SB 551 added some additional protection and provisions to help people. So that's a good thing. Yeah. But the reality of it is it's almost like the people who didn't pay their bills, and I realize people have problems and no disrespect to them, are looking for the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow against these associations for following what they thought the law said. And when the legislature passed SB 551, unanimously in the Senate, and by a supermajority in the House, they said, well, this was our real intent. So why wouldn't the governor want to sign it? Why don't we talk about that after the break? Okay, well, you've reminded me we're on a break. Uh -huh. And I have an introductory question on that. I'm going to come back and ask you that again, but after my introductory question. Okay. So we're going to take a little break right now as Jane and I recover from all this stress of this SB 551, <laughs> and we'll be right back to talk about this some more. Aloha, this is Scott Perry, and I'm the host of Let's Talk Hawaii at Think Tech Hawaii. In this show, we're going to be speaking in English and Japanese, 
And I'm going to use my 30 years of experience to help many Japanese viewers improve their English skills, as well as learning many interesting things about Hawaii. You can catch my show every other Tuesday, 3 p.m. Hawaii time. See you then. Aloha, my name is Mark Shklov. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea. Law Across the Sea is on Think Tech Hawaii every other Monday at 11 a.m. Please join me where my guests talk about law topics and ideas and music and Hawaiiana all across the sea from Hawaii and back again. Aloha. Welcome back to Condo Insider. Hopefully this is the last show on SB551, but you know, this is a critical matter and we're again gonna have a, a call to arms for you to do something in this. It is critical for the benefit of all the associations uh, to take action and notify their governor, our governor, uh, of their feelings on this. But I would like to compliment the legislature for stepping up, acknowledging what they promised in 1999, and yes, some didn't understand in the legislative body, but I need to compliment the legislature for standing up for what was right and what they promised the associations and protecting the associations. So we've talked about SB 551 and how all these associations that, in order to protect the association, foreclosed on non-paying owners are now being sued, asking for damages from the paying owners because of the alleged non-proper use of non-judicial foreclosure because the Intermediate Court of Appeals said, well, you, the legislative intent's unclear. So why wouldn't the governor just sign this? Why wouldn't he sign it? Because, yeah, well, there's, because there is a, a, a very strong, uh, not a very strong, but there, there are people out there who are opposed to Senate Bill 551. And to me, I put them in two buckets. One are the people that you described who want to sue the association uh, and, 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 and get money you know, from the people who are there now. And we're talking about non-judicial foreclosures that happened in 2008 through 2011. And if they find one and, and, they, and, and that happened in your building and they sue you, I mean, then your building is going to you know, have to pay for lawyers and defend yourselves and maybe end up you know, making a payment to these people unless 551 is signed. And then there is a bunch, there is a group of residents and they feel that, that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, the, that by signing, if, if they could get the governor to veto 551, that foreclosures relating to, uh, you know, unpaid, uh, uh, you know, late charges and anything but common expenses will stop. But we addressed that last year when we fixed, you know, when we fixed the priority of payments situation. Oh. And oh. so, so I, I say to those people, you know, we fixed that issue. You know, the, the legislature made it really clear that foreclosure because you didn't pay your penalties and late charges and legal fees is not permitted. That's why the pro act on 195 that was passed last year addresses that. And I think people don't understand that, that going forward, that's not going to be an issue, or it shouldn't so, be an issue. I have heard estimates that this could be tens of millions of dollars if you took all these foreclosures, look at all the lawsuits are filed. The associations are going to be liable, not ASO, an association, but all these associations for collectively for tens of millions of dollars if this, uh, if this SB 551 does not become uh, law. And part of it comes from the fact that they're going to have to defend these lawsuits. Some of the insurance companies are denying defense on this particular issue. They're changing policies as we speak now. And these homeowners who think they're doing themselves a favor by preventing foreclosure doesn't understand that Act 195 cure, cure disorder. Right. They're actually hurting everybody else in their building. That's what I, you know, that's, and we're, we're trying to persuade them that that's not the case. But a lot of people don't understand Act 195. And it was only passed last year. So, you know, it's going to be a while before the effects of that change are going to be felt in the community. 
Well, I asked a lawyer at lunch today when we were at this other seminar what he thought, and uh, he felt positive about the bill because always two sides to things, and the governor's pretty smart, and he has a sophisticated staff that they'll, they'll probably get to the surface what the issues are, why the governor wouldn't sign it. And th his words were, that, well, the issue he understands the problem is, quote, it's retroactive. Now, the attorney general never testified against this bill and it's retroactive issue. They certainly noticed the fact that's what the bill accomplishes. Mm -hmm. But his words were, not mine, and I agree with him, though, was it's not retroactive. What it is is just confirming what they originally did. Right. So it's not retroactive. It, it's only confirming that what we've been doing since 1999 through 2012 was what our intent was. So it's not making something retroactive. It's really just confirming what the process has been all along. And in the, in the, in the bill itself, in, in Bill uh, 551, uh, they do spend a lot of time in the beginning of the bill giving the history of how non-judicial foreclosures came about and the fact that it was in 514A in 1999 and when 514B came along in 2004, it got passed by the legislature with the same language in it because they had a chance to change it. Nobody changed it. And, you know, so it's like, you know, it was, it was, it was developed in 1999. It was passed. It was fully vetted and it, it was in operation come 2004, 2006. It was another chance to, you know, uh, undo it because it, we had the recodification with 514B and, not, and nobody raised, you know, a concern. Briefly, because I know we want to have a call to action here in a moment, but just briefly tell us a couple of the enhancements that came out of SB 551. Like, for example, it's my understanding if a person is on active duty military, you can't use non-judicial foreclosure. Right, you have, to, you have to go through judicial foreclosure. And uh, under the Soldiers and Sailors Act, the, the plaintiff, which is the person who's doing the for, uh, initiating the foreclosure, has to make a motion to the court, and the court will appoint an attorney. Uh, who is usually paid for by the plaintiff to represent the active duty military. And so, so, so he's represented by counsel. Uh, he doesn't have to pay for it. And wasn't there also in the bill now that that owner, if you're going to do a non-judicial, they have a right to mediation? Yes, uh, you have a right to mediation, uh, and you, you can, you, but you have to do it within 60 days of, you know, the note, when you get your notice of uh, foreclosure. You can't, you can't wait and, you know, wait. Uh, you know, I think beyond a certain time, then, then it's too late. But once you get that notice of foreclosure, if you apply for mediation, you're entitled to get it. So and, and, then, and then another thing is that, you know, and, you know, what happens is when you uh, get the notice, I mean, it, I think one of the issues that, that um, was confusing for the consumer is when the association did the non-judicial foreclosure, the consumer thought that their mortgage was going away. Right. And so that's why they didn't bother to defend it. And so when they get their notice of foreclosure, it's they, they get very clear language in there that this does not affect your mortgage. Well, let's get to our call to action. The yeah, most yeah. important part. This is sitting before the governor. We don't know what he's going to do. He has until June 24th to announce what might be on the veto list. Right. And then he has until July 7th to veto. Otherwise, it will become law without signature. Right. The governor needs to hear from condo owners the value of this and the importance of this. So what would you like our well, listeners to do? Okay, we have a, a, a form here, and it's, it's a, it tells you how you can go on the website. And it's uh, to let Governor Ige know that you support Senate Bill 551. And it's, uh, uh, the website is uh, governor.hawaii.gov. And when and you'll see, and this is what you're going to see on the screen. And, and there's um, there's places where you can put your name and address, and you need to let the governor know that he should pass uh, Senate Bill 551. And this is really important. Uh, and for those of you who who feel well, you know, it's not my place. It is your place because if you don't act, and if your neighbors don't act. And if people who live in condominiums do nothing and the governor decides, OK, those guys don't care, he may veto the bill. Because right now, as we speak, there are lots of people 
you know, because it's, you know, and it's a, it's a very emotional thing about losing your home. And, and so that's the, 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 the message that's going to the governor from the opponents of Senate Bill 551 is that, you know, he should veto it so that people who live in condominiums can't lose their homes through non-judicial foreclosure. And that's a fallacy uh, because they, uh, in most situations, uh, unless you do nothing when you get the notice of uh, uh, default, you won't lose your home. In, in a non-judicial foreclosure. And so it's really important. It's, and, and, you know, non-judicial foreclosure is important for those people who live in condominiums and pay their maintenance fees. Because, you know, if, if, if you pay your maintenance fees and your neighbor doesn't, I mean, in the end, you're going to end up subsidizing, you know, that uh, unit owner. And if you have too many people who don't pay their maintenance fees, then the next year, your maintenance fees are going to go up. And that's not fair to the people who, you know, who, who do what they're, you know, supposed to and pay their maintenance fees when they become due. And that's why it's, it's really well, important to, you know, to make sure that this should be gets, noted, too, if associations are forced into judicial foreclosure alone, that's a two or three times the cost of a non-judicial foreclosure. So it's going to become out of the common pot of the association, which, which means they're going to have less money. They don't budget for foreclosures. And that means the maintenance fees will go up again. Right. So, and, and, and for the people who are being foreclosed in a non-judicial foreclosure, the uh, person who's doing the foreclosure can't get a judgment. But in a judicial foreclosure, which ta is more expensive and takes more, more time, there's going to be a judgment against the homeowner. Let's put that form up one more time on the screen and remind you who are watching as individual owners or if you do own in a condominium, you're affected by this. If you're on the board, there's no reason you can't go to your board and say, let's have our association submit a form in support of this legislation. But we need not to stick our head in the sand and think everything's going to be okay. This has got enough political vibrations by those people, particularly lawyers who want to make some money out of this, to have this bill vetoed. And this is a critical bill for the association. Any final words in our last 55 seconds? Go to governor.hawaii.gov and tell Governor Ige to pass Senate Bill 551. And let me echo the same words. Go to governor.hawaii.gov and tell Governor Ige to support and sign or allow to pass SB 551. It's in the best interest of the association, its members, its owners, and the law has been modified so many times to protect the rights of individual owners who might be in default by not paying, that this applies to the people who just grossly ignore their responsibilities. And on that note, thank you for watching Condo Insider. We'll be back next Thursday at 3 o'clock, and we appreciate you watching our show, and aloha.